Hello everyone, welcome to another Chinta.com video. I'm Rajdeep Ghosh. Um, this will be part of uh, a series on combinatorics, which is a sub-series of a larger series I'll be doing to cover the entire Olympiad and ISIC and my syllabus. Um, the first lecture on this topic will be about the theory of invariance. The problem that we'll be discussing will be Arthur Engel E3, which is the book Problem Solving Strategies by Arthur Engel. Problem solving a book that I recommend for Olympiad Combinatorics, slightly high level, but it's a great book nonetheless. Uh, the we are doing the third exercise problem so that we'll be discussing is how do you react to problems? The process we'll define a process with some amount of formalism later on, but I think the general idea is clear to most viewers. How do you react to a problem with a certain background process, a process that's continuing for, say, a certain number of steps? How do you comment on whether a certain property holds true at the end state or not? Say there is an end state or even if there isn't. We want to make predictions about the properties of all the future states. How do we do that? We do it with the help of an invariant. <clears throat> what is an invariant? How, to, how is it helpful? How do we construct uh, an invariant? We'll come to that later. As I said, the relevant problem will be E3, the third example problem from chapter one, the invariance principle of problem solving strategies by Arthur Engel. Obviously, there's a challenge problem at the end. Um, we would like the best comments on our, on this video um, as responses in general or as or solutions to the challenge problem. The best uh, solutions and the best comments will receive either a, a mention in the next video and the best responders over a month will be considered for the Ramanujan, Ramanujan Scholarship at chinta.com. To read more about the Ramanujan Scholarship, feel free here. The problem is that we have a circle that we have a circle sorry for the drawing oh god and we've divided it into six segments six segments written the numbers 1 0 1 0 0 0 in them in a counterclockwise fashion it doesn't really matter if you do it in a clockwise or a counterclockwise fashion but um let's go with counterclockwise what we are allowed to do is we can take two neighboring sectors and increase the numbers in them by one at the same time so we can say take these two sectors Say we can take um, these two sectors and increase them both by one. We can do a plus one here and a plus one here to get a new setting. Maybe you can change the system to get two one zero zero one zero. This is what a this is what a one step of a process could look like. The answer, the answer that we're trying to find is, is it possible to equalize all the numbers by a sequence of such steps? So you start so you start with this setting and we do this process until we get all numbers to be equal. Now is this, is this a possible scenario? This is the question we're trying to answer. Now, I would just like to take a few moments to discuss what the invariance principle even is and how is it helpful. You have a certain process. So say you have a certain object, we'll call it T, and uh, there is a change happening to the process. So it, it goes from say T0 to T1. There's a process that's happening. This is your state. This process is happening. These are all states of your object. Now you want to make comments about all the future states. So say you want to make comments about I don't know, T5 and up. We want to make some comments about this. So what the what the usual idea is, we want to find a function of the state. So this is a little bit of formalism, but it's it's uh, slightly helpful than just throwing around words. Um, we define a function on the state such that 
f of t t zero is equal to f of t one. And because the change is the same, we are applying the same change over and over again. So the change that happens between t naught and t one is the same change that happens between t one and t two. This keeps on happening. So this is the, the function f is what we call an invariant of the state. It is a it, it is a quantity that stays the same throughout the process. Now, do you see how that is helpful? So you know, if something is true, if this if if the value of this quantity is something at the beginning. If f of t zero is something c, and this is known to us, f of t n is equal to c for all, all the uh, for all n. So this is so this is extremely helpful. We can make um, comments about the property f of this of all the future states. Now this is a lot of formalism, and in fact this is what we call a heuristic principle. The invariance principle is what we call a heuristic principle. It's just a fancy word which means that it's the kind of principle where there is no big central theory. It's the kind of thing that you can learn only through pro through problems. There is so there is not much theory to it. It's mostly problem solving, and though you get more and more well versed with the theory simply by doing more problems. So coming to the problem. So obviously the idea is to construct an invariant. We would like to take our setup. The numbers themselves are irrelevant because the process. Uh, well, they are relevant, obviously, but. The way you could change them with you could shift them uh, all by the same quantity and they would be the same. Point is that if I have a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six, we would like to find an invariant up with the state. So the state could the circles and the sectors are um, slightly they set you off a little bit. The point is that you can take any two. Consecutive one and a six and a one are considered consecutive, and you can in increase both of them by one, or something like this. This is what the state is. You would like to for now you, uh, an invariant is not immediately visible, so you would like to construct an invariant with some cleverness. Clearly, what what's happening is we take two adjacent sectors, consecutive sectors, and we increase them both by one. Doesn't doesn't it make sense? To just consider a one minus a two, right? So if we consider a one minus a two, since they are both increasing by one, there is no net change. The thing is, you could also have increased a two and a three. Well, in that case, uh, we could need something like a three minus a two or a two minus a three. In this case, we could have a two minus a one or a one minus a two. Uh, either of these works, and they'll stay. These values stay the same. The thing is. We don't really know which which two numbers we'll pick, so we'll have to take a, we have to construct an invariant which stays the same no matter what move you make. So with some cleverness and noticing that a one minus a two a i minus a i plus one stays the same, if you if you you know fix a uh, if you you know take the sectors a i and a i plus one and you increase them both, their difference stays the same. If I consider this number. Note that this this features every single term of this kind. We have a one minus a two, a three minus a two, a three minus a four, a five minus a four, and a five minus a six, and a six minus a one. So no matter which two consecutive numbers you pick, since they since any two consecutive numbers have opposite signs, increasing both of them will not result in any change. So we found our invariant. So our invariant i. You can call it is a one minus a two plus a three minus a four plus a five. So no matter what moves you make, the value of a one minus this value has to stay the same. Note and well, we can see this as an example. If we start off like this, what is our initial? What is the value initially of i in our initial configuration? It's one minus zero plus zero minus zero plus one minus zero. Initially, it's two, right? And Uh, just as an example, if we increase these two, what happens is this becomes plus one, this becomes plus one. So we have two minus one, but this is still one, and there's a one here, so the value is still two. So do you see what's happening? The value stays the same. So initially the value is two. What would happen if, say, it was possible to get to a state where every single number was the same? In that case, isn't the value of this function, you know, a one minus a two, and so on, doesn't this become zero? 
So this end state is not possible. You cannot achieve this state simply by virtue of the fact that the invariant has to always be to it cannot be zero. So the answer to this question is no. And we're done. This is the problem. And uh, I hope I've made this idea clear. To quote Engel, this is directly from Engel, if there is repetition, look for what does not change. This helps us make guesses about the future states of a system undergoing said process, which is what we did here. We constructed an invariant which stayed the same, and hence we could make uh, predictions about all the future states, not just one. We know that the this you know um, all the sectors cannot have the same value simply because the invariant will not allow it. Sometimes an invariant may not be immediately visible. In such cases, some cleverness is required to construct a useful invariant. Now, you might find invariants, but they might not necessarily be useful. You need Sometimes you might need some cleverness to come up with an invariant. All the invariants help us make comments about certain properties of an object under a process. They don't necessarily always come in handy when it comes to predicting whether the process ends or not. You can say, well, is this state possible? You can say, well, if there is an end state, what can I say about it? We can answer these questions. But will the process end is a question that invariants do not help us answer. To answer these questions, we talk about monovariance in the next video. Here's the challenge problem. Feel free to try it and write down in the comments. I'll be waiting for your solutions. This is a very beautiful problem. Um, some of you may already have seen it, but for those of you who haven't, I encourage you to try it. Thank you so much.